Welcome to this lecture. So in our lecture notes, we are today working through subsection 10.4 about linear polynomials and truncated quadratic modules. So what is the motivation? My motivation is if you have finitely many polynomials and uh, uh, you look at the system of polynomial of non-strict polynomial inequalities given by it, so this defines a basic closed semi-algebraic set. And then you would like to solve some algorithmic questions related to this basic closed semi-algebraic set. For example, you would find you would like to find points in it. And one uh, tool we are studying here is the degree D Lasser relaxation, which um, gives um, a linear matrix inequality. Um, which um, whose solution set is a, is a spectrohedron that projects down on a superset of uh, the basic closed semi-algebraic set S of G, so a set of solutions of your system of polynomial inequalities. And since it's convex, it of course uh, contains a convex hull of S of G. And but what we what we would like is that it it is it is equal, right? And if, if this is equal, this uh, gives a lot of possibilities, right? Uh, so this uh, is, uh, yeah, this, uh, when it is, uh, should be quite easy to at least approximately uh, compute many points in S of G. Okay. Um, yes, so. The degree D Lasser relaxation so um, gets tighter and tighter when D grows, and uh, the, um, the hope is that for some degree D you have this equality, and when, when, if S of G is compact with non-empty interior, uh, which uh, basically uh, we will um, we will suppose uh, in in the important results of this section. Um, then uh, this is equivalent to this condition, right? So we have here this uh, characterization in terms of membership of linear polynomials, which are no negative on S of G in, a tr in the tr D truncated quadratic module associated to G. So it's about membership of linear polynomials in, um, in, quadrati in truncated quadratic modules. So Okay, so let's see what we have for truncated quadratic modules, right? So do we have some criteria for membership? Uh, let's look. Uh, yes, so we have... Uh, I have to find it. Yeah, we have, for example, this theorem here, right? So if M is an Archimedean quadratic module um, of if this also curly O, so here uh, we had a real closed extension field R of reals and a curly O were the um, finite elements in R, right? So this was a set of finite elements in R, elements that are bounded from above and from below by some integer. Okay, and so uh, when we uh, when we had this uh, quadratic, so this quadratic module defines a subset of R to the n, where R is now a real numbers, just by looking the core, uh, yeah inequalities where I take a standard part here, right? Um, and um, if we have pairwise distinct elements from O to the n. Um, I mean, not only pairwise distinct, but they even have to have pairwise distinct standard parts. So we are somehow not infinitesimally close. No, uh, no two of them are infinitesimally close. And if f uh, vanishes at these xi's, uh, well, to the second order, that means f vanishes and its gradient vanishes. Um, so this can be expressed by membership in the square of these ideals i, x, i, which are all the polynomials in O, x, which vanish at x, i. 
when um, uh, um, and 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 if if a standard part of f of x is positive, uh, except um, on on the whole of s, except that the standard parts of the x size. And if I have this, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, some. If I have um, positive definiteness of a standard part of the Hessian, you could say, at the x i's, uh, yeah, or at the standard part of the x i's, you could also say, when um, that's that would be equivalent, when f uh, lies in M, okay. So I need several things. So I need that we that f vanishes exactly at these x i's, right? Not just the standard part of f, so f exactly at the xi's, that's what this theorem requires. And I need that, uh, uh, well, and the other things here are about standard part things, right? So we, here the vanishing is to the second order, I would I, I have to say, right, at the xi's. So I need uh, that it's a, uh, that the xi's are a zero and a critical point in some sense, that means the gradient vanishes. and. I need, otherwise I need this positivity uh, outside the standard part of the xi's and I need that uh, the Hessian standard part of the Hessian is positive definite at the standard part of the xi's, the standard part, yeah, or the Hessian of the standard part of f, all that would be the same, right? Okay, and then f is in m. So now, uh, but if we have now linear polynomials, if you are dealing with linear polynomials, well, then uh, this is already very hard to satisfy. Uh, if k is at least one and f is a linear polynomial, uh, then this can only happen if f is a zero polynomial, right? <laughs> and then this is very unlikely, of course, to happen. And also with positive definiteness here of a standard part of the Hessian of at the standard parts of the xi. Is impossible, of course, right? And uh, of course, this corollary can not even this corollary can be employed, of course. And okay, so so what to do? So we the idea is to use this Lagrange multiplier stuff. Okay, so the idea is that you have here your um, let's see. So you have here your basic closed semi-algebraic set and well if, if let's say in in let's say it's uh, in our well here in this theorem we, we might it's not clear that this should be a basic closed semi-algebraic set in general right but Let's say we have a set, and we have a set, and sometimes, and uh, we will look at also at uh, at R to be n. So, and uh, and sometimes we will look uh, just at R to be n. And so, basically, the idea is that um, you um, take uh, and and I don't I don't know since it's just the basic ideas. I I even don't want to. Uh, specify if I'm looking at this space or this space. But the basic idea is that you have this linear polynomial and uh, it's non negative on your set. So, uh, so this should be its zero set maybe, and this should, and uh, it should, uh, its gradient would point into this direction so that it's non negative on this set. And when you have here a zero, and this is say um, x1, so this would be such an x1 here. And now, um, yes, and now um, the idea is that I, I use Lagrange multipliers, right? So let's say this set would be defined by a single equation for simplicity, saying that uh, g is greater than or equal zero, right? When I take and uh, my linear polynomial is uh, is L, and then I would say that uh, L. Um, I would hope that I get some kind of Lagrange multiplier such that L minus uh, lambda. 
um, chi uh, vanishes and, and its gradient, sorry, and its gradient. So lambda in R or R, I don't even know. Uh, such with L minus lambda G and its gradient vanish at xi. Yeah, so whether I have this double vanishing condition here and uh, and that uh, we um, yeah, when, when the question is why should, you know, G could be very, very positive here in the inside of this set, right? In, in the interior, if you want. Okay, so then in lambda should be no negative, of course. Sorry, I, I sh since it should be, it should be a no negative Lagrange multiplier. So if, uh, if, if lambda is zero, we again are stuck because this is linear. Now, if lambda is bigger than zero, um, we might be able to do something because, um, yeah, depending on, uh, yeah, if you are lucky, then this, uh, this minus lambda G makes our, makes our Hessian, uh, positive, definite. So now F would be this, right? And, uh, if you are lucky, then, uh, this might be positive now because of a minus lambda g. I mean, the L has no influence on the Hessian of F now because it's linear, but uh, we, if lambda is positive, uh, let's say the standard part of it actually should be perhaps be positive in the case where are in the real, if, if you are in the real closed field because we need here the standard part, but I don't go into these details now. And but uh, if uh, minus g, so if g would be, for example, negative definite at xi, if a Hessian of g, sorry, would be negative definite uh, at xi, when the Hessian of minus g is positive definite at, at xi, right? So if you are lucky, then, well, when, yeah. Uh, and uh, but now we have maybe another problem because g could be very positive here in the interior. But we want here where the standard part of f of x is positive almost everywhere, right, here in s, right? So except that at the standard part of this point. Okay, so uh, so, we, so we have to do some tricks. So in order that uh, that, um, that, g, that uh, I don't subtract a lot uh, if g gets large here, right? And such a trick will essentially be that I multiply here now I don't have any place anymore, but uh, yeah, let me let me write here. But I multiply here with something like uh, let's say I don't go into details now, but something like one minus g to a k, where k is big, k is big, and then uh, yeah, if this set here is for example compact in in R to n, then I can suppose. By scaling, by some scaling, I can suppose that G is not only non-negative on this set, but it's also less than or equal one, right? So G less than or equal one on S. And so if G gets rather big, so let's say G is, um, um, yeah, G gets uh, close to, to one or, or, or is close to one half or something like this, on some point here in the interior, for example, when um, when when this still gets very, when this gets actually very very small, right? When this gets very very small, if k is big, and so this means that you are not subtracting a lot where g is uh, not very small. When g is very small, you this factor is all close to one. When it doesn't change a lot, but where g is uh, bigger. Um, um, well, this this term here will make that I don't subtract a lot, right? And on the other hand, L, I mean, L is zero here and L will be positive here if it's not uh, the zero function, right? So, yeah, there is this trade-off between L and, and this function. So, and I have to make sure that I, I will satisfy this 
and uh, I have to sure that, make sure that I satisfy this and this, uh, such things, right? So it's not, uh, it's not easy and the uh, situation gets even more complicated if L has several touching points here, um, because when I have, uh, so if I have also an, an X2, let's say, and X1 would now be here, right? Um, so if this is my, my L, when I have maybe uh, more problems, because when I have several Lagrange multipliers here, I have here Lagrange multipliers different from both that are here. And then how do I combine them somehow, right? How do I make use of both of them? So these will be the questions that we'll be, that we'll, we'll be dealing with. And we will also have to deal with the standard part issues with uh, real closed fields because, yeah, uh, yeah, and we will have to deal with, um, um, I mean, I said that if you are very lucky, the Hessian will be positive definite, but usually we are not so lucky, right? But we will have some strict uh, concavity. We won't have strict concavity conditions, but only strict quasi-concavity conditions, etc. So we will have to deal with a lot, a lot of issues and it's very technical. And But I hope I explained the basic ideas now, right? How to use this Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so, uh, so let's go, go now into the middle of things. We start with this uh, little exercise here and this is really easy and uh, so for all uh, mm, positive integers k and x in the unit interval, so the closed interval of all numbers between 0 and 1, x times 1 minus x to the k is less than or equal to 1 over k. So this is really, <laughs> really easy and I will need this uh, later to, yeah, because we have here this g times 1 minus g to the k, we will have things like this. I mean, in reality, it will later be more complicated, but yeah, for these things, we need this. Yeah, it's an exercise. I think uh, you, you evaluate in 0 and in 1, and for x equals 0 and 1, the left hand side is 0. And when the only possibility, and, and when I, um, yeah, when I just have to check in the critical points uh, of a function x maps to this in the open interval between 0 and 1, and uh, well, the derivative of this with respect to x is uh, by the product rule 1 minus x to a k plus x times k times 1 minus x to a k minus 1 times minus 1 because of a minus x, right? And so here I can factor out 1 minus, I can factor out 1 minus x to a k minus 1 and when I have here 1 plus, or sorry, 1 minus x k and the only way that can vanish for x strictly between 0 and 1 is that this term vanishes and then that happens for x equals 1 over k. And so if I, if I evaluate uh, or if I set here x equals 1 over k, I get uh, 1 over k times 1 minus 1 over k to a k, and that's less than or equal 1 over k. Yeah, and that's why this holds. Okay, but that was really, uh, I mean, high school. High school mathematics. So now the main geometric idea and the proof of the following theorem. So what's the following theorem? Following theorem will be this. So let um, suppose we have finitely many polynomials over the reals, and we look at the quadratic module generated by them, m of g, and we suppose this is Archimedean, and we suppose that you know the basic closed semi-algebraic set defined by g. That is now, of course, a compact subset of R to the n, where R is the reals. And suppose it has non-empty interior near its convex boundary, right? So, convex boundary, you remember, okay, so, convex boundary, I take the convex hull. Um, so, if this is my set S, and I take the convex hull, do it in green. OK, 
okay. And then, so let's do convex hull of this. And then the convex boundary is this. Perhaps, right? So, so it's the part of S that lies in the, in the boundary of a convex hull, right? And uh, having non-empty interior near the convex boundary means if you take a point in the convex boundary uh, and you take an arbitrary neighborhood around it, uh, like this one, or you know, you have a point here in the convex boundary and take an arbitrary neighborhood when it intersects with no, the interior of, of S, right? Okay, so that's, um, that's, uh, that seems to be the case in our picture at least, right? And, okay, and um, suppose that each GI is strictly quasi-concave on the convex boundary intersected the zero set, the real zero set of GI. So the thing is that, um, yeah, on, um, on, on most points, well, on these elements of, uh, of a convex boundary of S, uh, they are, yeah, some, one, one, one of the GIs has to, I mean, all GIs are non-negative because they are these points, I mean, these red points or points of a convex boundary, they lie in S, so on each of these red points where GIs are non-negative, it, it's not possible that they are all positive, otherwise they would be in the interior of S, and therefore in the interior of a convex hull of S, and I would not be on the boundary of a convex hull, right? So one of each eyes has to vanish, of course, right? And maybe, uh, yeah, maybe most of the times it's just one chi, right? And uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, if all the other, if all the other, if all other chi eyes are positive, which will very often be the case, and just one of them vanishes, then uh, this uh, strict quasi-concavity condition is um, not at all. Uh, improbable, let's say it's, it looks uh, like a more a, a mild condition, right? I mean, where is there is a thing, the issue with a strict, let's say we did, we never defined what non strict would mean, right? But at least the strict uh, probably refers to the fact that we have that we transpose Hessian of GI at, at the point V is positive if, if a vector V is non-zero vector is strictly positive, right? And that, you know, we, we, we learned what, what that means. We learned that this is, um, that means that I have really, yeah, in some sense, I have some real, really some curvature in some sense, right? Which is obvious here from the second derivative of GI or which, um, which becomes apparent regarding the second derivative of VGI. Exactly. So it doesn't seem like a, a an, an, it seems like a mild condition actually, right? Relatively mild, not completely mild because it, it excludes, for example, things like, uh, you know, I, if I had a second GI, um, this one, which uh, whose zero set is here and which is linear, maybe, and then so that S is actually the yellow, yellow region here because the second uh, this linear polynomial cuts out all this, these things, right? When uh, when these points would be on the convex boundary here, but uh, this condition would uh, would not uh, be fulfilled with strict quasi concavity, right? So it 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 is a real condition. Uh, it excludes uh, some flat things, for example, <laughs> loosely speaking, uh, at a boundary, and that's a real problem, maybe. And, but otherwise, it doesn't exclude so much things, right? Okay, now let's see what I wrote here. The main geometric idea in the proof of this theorem is as follows. Consider a hyperplane that isolates a basic closed semi-algebraic subset of R to Vn 
and that is defined over a real closed extension field of R, right? So yeah, that's with L, right? So well, zero set of L if you want, yeah. So um, let's say this is the zero set of L. Mm, yes, uh, and um, and uh, and that's the gradient points into that direction. That's gradient of L. Okay, and um, and yeah, we want to apply theorem nine one fourteen. We will not be that able to do that uh, um, so easily, right? Um, so we will use this Lagrange multiplier trick and so on. But uh, essentially, uh, the problem will be the points where the hyperplane gets infinitesimally close to the set. Um, so, um, yes, so um, un unless the hyperplane exactly touches the set in the respective point. Okay, so um, I mean, if, if, um, yeah, if this, if this L is, if a standard part of L is strictly positive on S, when I can apply, of course, um, yeah, when I, I can apply this theorem with k equals zero, when I don't need one uh, such a point, right? Because when I have simply that the standard part of F, S, F uh, is positive of uh, this linear uh, polynomial L, which is now my F, is positive on S, right? And when L lies in M. Okay, so if 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 the hyperplane doesn't doesn't come infinitesimally close to S, when everything is 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 really easy, okay. I mean, with the theory we have already, right? But if if it comes infin infinitesimally close, right? If it comes infinitesimally close, let's say it comes infinitesimally close here around here, right? Uh, and of course, it's not easy to draw an infinitesimal gap here, but that's what I mean. Um, well, when you can just move it uh, a little bit uh, further towards the set, right? And um, so, so that it will hit the set. Uh, at least we will prove something like this, right? So that it will hit here the set, okay? And then if, if it doesn't come infinitesimally close, so it t exactly touches the set here, right? And then if it doesn't come infinitesimally close here, when I can use this Lagrange multiplier um, trick uh, I have already um, shown you more or less, exactly in this point where it touches here. And okay, there are some details to clarify, and it's even that is not it's not clear how you do this exactly, etc. But uh, the only thing I want to sh uh, say now is that it it will be much harder if at the same time it comes infinitesimally close here, right? So let's say let me make, let me draw it again. So if my hyperplane. Uh, let's say it's non negative on S. I mean, the linear polynomial is non negative on S, so a hyperplane isolates S if you want. And so it exactly touches here in a point, right? And, uh, and, and here it's in just an infinitesimal distance here, here locally, right? And, um, and, and that will be a problem, right? That will be actually a problem. Because uh, I I don't have it uh, you know in in my theorem here, um, I I can define the x one is the, the first point the point where it touches, and the x but x two I don't know what that should be because I want here that f really vanishes at at the x size right. And I mean, anyway, I will not take uh, F anymore. I will do this Lagrange multiplier trick. So I'll change F. I will change L if you want. L is now my function. I will change it. That's the other story. But anyway, um, it will be a problem that, uh, that uh, it, it touches uh, it touches here. That's my X1. 
but I cannot, um, I cannot, uh, yeah, so, um, I, I would have to, um, yeah, so, so, so what, what, what we will actually do is we will, we will have to define an X2 here, <laughs> somewhere, somewhere, roughly speaking. And, and when we will have to do an infinitesimal deformation somehow of my, of my hyperplane. So let, let, let me do this uh, in, in, well, what, what language, what, uh, what's a good, uh, let's choose uh, orange or something. Okay, so, so something, you know, like this, and this will no longer be a linear polynomial anyway. So, and, and when I do the Lagrange multiplier tricks here, yeah, in x, x1 and x2, yeah, that's, that's very roughly what happens. That's very roughly what happens. And, and what I say here is, uh, I mean, maybe it's not even easy to understand now, even, even with what I explained, but we want to apply this theorem and the points where the hyperplane gets infinitesimally close to the set pose problems unless the hyperplane exactly touches the set in the respective point. The idea is to find a non-linear infinitesimal deformation of a hyperplane plane so that all infinitesimally near points becoming touching points. This would be easy if there is at most one infinitesimally near point, but since we're dealing with this article with not necessarily convex basic closed semi-algebraic sets, it is crucial to cope with several such points, right? So if S were convex, then probably at least it seems I would have only one such point here, right? But I can have several ones. I mean, if I'm very lucky, when it touches in several points, right? Uh, and uh, and then um, and. When I, but when still the problem that there are different Lagrange multipliers here, so there are still some problems, okay? So I hope very roughly I could give some ideas, but now comes the formal proof anyway. Now comes the formal proof anyway, and I really don't know if, uh, I mean, it might have been confusing what I said so far, when just rely on the formal proof now. Okay, so, okay, so we go to the next page. Okay, so now let's uh, let's try to prove this theorem. Okay, so we will apply theorem nine one fourteen. That's the one here, okay? And, but we won't apply it directly to L. So, uh, since S is compact, we can rescale the GIs and suppose without loss of generality that GI is at most one on S. That's clear, right? It's just a matter of scaling with GIs. Um, and and I think I made already clear uh, why uh, this, uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I made already clear why this will help in the end. Uh, that's because of this trick where I subtract gi times 1 minus gi to the k, right? This 1 minus gi to the k gets small uh, in, in a, well, if you are somehow, uh, well in the interior face, let's say. Okay, so, um, okay, so, um, let M denote a quadratic module generated by which is uh, over this curly O, over the subring of finite elements in the real closed field R. And since M of G is Archimedean, also M is Archimedean, well, that's easy because M of G Archimedean by 1813B, let's see, means that, for example, that n minus sum of vxi squared lies in it, right 
here for some capital N and um, and by 9, 1, 2, B, that's uh, also what it means for uh, here. If you have a quadratic module over curly O, then that's, uh, we have the same characterization, right, of, Archim of the Archimedean property. So, moreover, S could now alternatively be defined from M as in theorem 9.1.14. So, we, yeah, we, 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 S in 9.1.14, uh, you know, is, uh, well, here you take these uh, standard parts, right? But our polynomials P, well, I mean, the polynomials, the generators of our quadratic module of OX are with GIs and they have real, yeah, and you, you see that you can restrict here to generators, of course, right? That's easy to see. And, uh, but the generators have co real coefficients, really. So, and since you are plugging in only real points, then you can forget about the standard part here. Okay. And so, and in this way, you see that the S from 9114 is really our S of G in this, in this uh, case. That's, uh, little sub subtle observations we have to make here, right? Uh, moreover, uh, yes, so, um, yes, because S is S of G in our case, and in 9114 it was defined differently, but it's the same here in our case. So, um, so now write uh, L equals F minus C, so it's uh, where uh, linear form F, with a linear form F, and some c. So it's just where I split up a linear polynomial in its part which is homogeneous of degree one and the part and the constant part and I write it as f minus c. I could also write it as, as, <laughs> as f plus c but I decided to take f minus c for some reason. So by a rescaling argument we can suppose that at least one of the coefficients of L um, is not infinitesimal. I mean they are all finite but uh, I can suppose that one of them is uh, is not infinitesimal. That's just a matter of uh, scaling uh, L. I mean, if, if all are infinitesimal, uh, then, uh, then I can, yeah, I can take the, I can divide by the one which is biggest in absolute value, right? And uh, and uh, and this and um, yeah, and then once I've shown that this new uh, linear polynomial lies here, when I can um, multiply with the same infinitesimal number, and I see that it's uh, it's again there. Okay, so but that's a rescaling argument. So if a standard part of L of X is positive for all X in S, when theorem 9.1.14 applied to L with K equals zero yields L in M, and we are done, right? Because, yeah, that's what I said already. I guess that uh, if this is true for all X in S, when we are done, when I can take K equals zero, when this condition is empty, and this condition is empty, and when F lies in M. Okay. Uh, hence, we can from now on suppose that there is some u in S such that the standard part of L of u is zero. That, that means that L somehow comes infinitesimally close to, to S. Right? So, my picture is as follows. This is uh, my S and L comes infinitesimally close somewhere, maybe here. Right? For such a u, uh, for such an u, we have at the standard part of C. Aha! Uh -huh. So what? Where? Where is the u now? The u, uh, would, the u is real, by the way. U is in S. Uh, it's a real uh, point, right? So, um, and this should be an infinitesimal gap, not easy to draw. Okay. So, 
So for such an U, we have a standard part of, you know, at L of, uh, standard part of L of U is zero. So a standard part of C equals the standard part of F of U, of course. So that at least one coefficient of F must uh, be a unit, must be non-infinitesimal in the ring of finite elements. That means uh, it's a unit in the ring of finite elements. Yeah, because if, uh, you know, if every coefficient of F uh, were infinitesimal, when f of uh, well, when uh, f of u would also be infinitesimal, right? And you know, and uh, and when the standard part would be zero, and the standard part of c would be zero, but when c would be infinitesimal, now all the coefficients of l would be infinitesimal, which was not the case, since we well since we supposed without loss of generality that this is not the case. So actually one coefficient of f must lie, must be a unit in Kalio. Okay. Um, so now, uh, you know, we can, so now the gradient of f, what is the gradient of f? What is the two norm of the gradient of f? Well, the gradient of f is just vector of coefficients of this uh, homogeneous uh, linear polynomial f. And uh, so, um, and so, since they are all finite, and uh, and at least one of them is not infinitesimal, this is uh, this two norm here is of course uh, uh, finite and non-infinitesimal. <laughs> and then I can, uh, if I yeah by a suitable scaling, you know, dividing by by this norm, uh, which is invertible in Curlio, uh, we can suppose that this norm is one, right? So that's another scaling argument, so that the norm of the gradient is one. And now we are in the situation of lemma 1038. 1038 uh, was this lemma. Um, so here we had uh, a linear form uh, such that the norm of gradient is one. Otherwise, uh, you know, I have this S of G is compact. I have because uh, M of G was Archimedean. Uh, I have non-empty interior near its convex boundary. And I have the same uh, hypothesis where GI is strictly quasi-concave here, where it is active on the convex boundary. So I have all these, uh, everything is, uh, all these hypotheses are fulfilled. And now I have, uh, you know, the set F of all U in S uh, such that the standard part of F is minimized in U uh, on S, right? And that's a finite subset of a convex boundary of S. And um, yes, so maybe, maybe we read the other two things later. So when we draw first the picture, uh, yeah, if this uh, here is an infinitesimal distance, uh, okay, so maybe I should draw the convex boundary again. Maybe it's something like this, the convex boundary. Yes, and so there is this... Uh, there is this real point U here, and um, it's it's a finite set. It could also be, I mean, if a linear form is different, if a linear form is different, uh, maybe I draw an alternative one, a green one here, right? Uh, and yeah, you know, maybe it comes, it comes infinitesimally close here and here. And then I need two points. I need uh, u1. Uh, I need u1, maybe almost the same as u, and u2, or something, right? And um, yeah, that's that's the idea. Uh, so I have these points uh, where the standard part uh, is uh, is minimized and. Uh, 
and uh, I mean, if I take a standard part of F or L, it doesn't matter, right? Because it's just up to constant, it's the same thing. And uh, so F is this homogeneous degree one part. And now if S is S prime is the transfer of S, uh, that's of course containing curly O to Vn because S is compact and therefore bounded. F has a unique minimizer XU on this transfer, uh, namely kind of an infinitesimal uh, neighborhood of, of U for each U in F. And uh, and then I will actually uh, yes when I when I take f minus f of x u and I uh, apply the Lagrange multiplier uh, method <laughs> which we have devised. Um, so the picture is like this. Um, maybe I should draw a new new picture actually, sorry. Okay, let me draw a new picture. And let me look again at the, at the lemma, maybe I copy the lemma here. Okay, so I have here with set S, blue set. And when I have this, uh, you know, L, and well, it doesn't matter, I mean, L could also be this, so. But when, what, what I'm looking here is where, where the standard part of L is minimized on, on S. And, uh, ah, okay, then maybe I should take another L. Okay, maybe this one. And the standard part of L is minimized on S. And that's maybe this point, that's U1. And the other one is U2, right? And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, here I have bad luck. I have two minimizers. Um, and, uh, and now in in an in this kind of an infinitesimal neighborhood of of these u1 and u2 really infinitesimal hard to draw of course uh i have really these uh in in a transfer of s i have these uh i have these uh yeah i have a uni i have this minimizes xu where uh, really um where really, very, really, really, f is minimized, right? Not only the standard part of f. So, so the idea is that this x u two will probably lie very in, probably lie uh, very, very close to u two, infinitesimally close, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does actually because I'm saying that it is in this infinitesimal neighborhood, right? And. Um, Yes, and, uh, and, and, and maybe, um, you know, if you move this black line here, uh, when, when you could move it, that it, it, it hits, uh, that it isol isolates the transfer of S and it hits one of these XUs exactly, but maybe it's only infinitesimally close to the other one, right? So so that's so that's the idea. Okay. Um, and and for for every u in f now we have these Lagrange multipliers, right? Uh, Non-negative Lagrange multipliers, finite, where sum is is not uh, infinitesimal. That will be important later. And uh, f minus f of x u minus the sum. Of lambda u i g i and it's graded vanish at at x u. <laughs> okay, so 
Okay, so now let's uh, let's define f uh, x u and v lambda u i. So I need all of them, right? I need so I need an an index because yeah, for v x u we had already uh, we had already v x u here. Ah, yeah, and v lambda u i is right, exactly like here, exactly like here, right? And I define them exactly like here. And now f, uh, uh, which is the set of these green points with finitely many green points, um, yeah, f is the set of all u in s where the standard part of L of u is, is zero. Um, why is this? Since, um, okay, the standard part of L of x is non negative for all x in s, and there is this. Um, there is this u in s with standard part of l of u equals zero, right? So if something is uh, ah okay, I could I could also write here l instead of f, right? Just by subtracting c on both sides, inside uh, I'm or standard part of c on both sides, right? I could write here uh, l instead of f, where l is our l now, and uh, so if something is in f then it must satisfy this, uh, this uh, condition or so you know we have this we have this u0 if you want with standard part L of u0 is 0 and uh, so if something is in f then it must set I could for x I could take this u0 when when it when it must satisfy that the standard part of L of u is less than or equal 0 on the other hand if u is in s, the standard part of L of, of u is greater than or equal to zero. So you see if something is in f, the standard part of L of, if u is in s, if u is in f, then the standard part of L of u must be zero, right? And conversely, it's now also easy to see, right? So so it's it's easy to see that f is this and that this is non non empty so so this picture was slightly inadequate so because we had already assumed that we have that this black thing here somehow gets infinitely close to s that was already here when we said that there is this uh, u zero here right so um, now we have that f of x u minus c equals l of x u is greater than or equals zero. Of course, for each uh, u in f. And we have standard part of f of x u minus c um, equals standard part l of uh, x u, which is the standard part of l of u, right? Because the standard part of x u is u, right? Standard part of x u uh, is u. x u was in this infinitesimal, infinitesimal neighborhood of u for each u in f. And uh, standard part of L of u is zero for all u in f. Okay, so, and hence f of x u minus c is uh, infinitesimal, and it's also non-negative, uh, right? And for all u in f. Yeah, so I have this non-negative infinitesimal distance here to be uh, to to be x use right uh, in, in fact um, yes in fact uh, yes exactly right okay so now so now what 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 I could do I, I could move the the black uh, I could, could move this uh, fn hyperplane 
a little bit closer so it, so it actually hits exactly one of the XUs. And maybe I said at some point that I will do this, but that's not quite true. Because I, I can anyway, if I do this, I might still have a problem elsewhere. And I, I will deal with, with all these problems by taking some infinitesimal deformation. And, okay, so uh, so how, how is this going? So uh, now it gets a bit complicated. So... Um, so what I'm looking at is um, L minus f of x u minus c. So that's uh, you know that's L of L of x u, right? And um, and uh, so so that that would be uh so that would be moving the the black lines so that so that it hits x actually the the x x u so and and that that would be my yeah so um so that would be moving this black line in such a way that it hits actually the x u right by doing this thing here and uh, call this lambda u zero that's infinitesimal and uh yeah we have just seen that this is infinitesimal and it's non negative and uh now uh if i do this when when it actually hits the x u right but okay but this thing this thing might no longer be non negative on the whole transfer of s remember right but anyway but anyway here i get the lagrange multipliers i get the lagrange multipliers it's exactly what we do here right I get these Lagrange multipliers from C, right? And um, and these Lagrange multipliers are finite and non-negative. So I get this by by condition C from ten three eight uh, from ten three eight and by nine one thirteen. What was nine one thirteen? Nine one thirteen. Ah, it was just this. Uh, yes, why do I need this? Ah, that, that just means that... Uh, aha, well, sorry, that just means... Uh, yeah, okay, because if I evaluate this in x0, when this is 0, and this is also 0, because, uh, you know, because... Um, ah, no, no, yeah, okay, it's just because by condition C, uh, this vanishes and its gradient vanish. And that just means that this lies in this uh, I X U squared. Yeah, yeah, okay. So evaluating this in X U uh, yields, um, yeah, and using that GI of X U is greater than or equal zero, right? X U lies of course, um, in the in the transfer of S, right? So X U um, is in the in the transfer of S in this S prime here. Okay, uh, we we have that. Uh, okay, if I evaluate this in X U, when this is zero, uh, when uh, when I get here that uh, the sum of the lambda u i g i of x u are zero, right? So, but um, but g i of x u are non-negative. So whenever g i of x u is positive, when the corresponding lambda u i has to be zero, right? Um, and thus, uh, so let me call this star. And thus, uh, we, I have that uh, lambda u g i uh is uh congruent modulo the ideal i x u squared to lambda u i uh g i one minus g i to a k um uh, for all u in f i in one to m and k in n um you know because if g i of uh so what does that mean that means that uh the uh, well, if uh, um, 
if chi of x u is uh, not zero and lambda u i is zero, and so this is trivial, right? So I have to verify this only in the case where chi of x u is zero. But if chi of x u is zero, then uh, this uh, when it is um, when I have it, um, yeah, I have that one minus one minus chi to the k lies in i x u, right? Yeah, and if chi of x u is zero, then uh, I can multiply here with chi, and I get that this is an i x u squared, right? Okay, good. Okay, and uh, and that uh, that shows this in the case where lambda u i is not zero, and if lambda u i is zero, then this is trivial. So by the Chinese remainder theorem, we find polynomials S i such that uh, ah okay so now yeah uh, okay so um, so now it gets tricky, <laughs> uh, namely uh, yeah so um, so uh, the problem is with Lagrange multipliers, right? That they are not the same. So 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 what I'm I think what what I'm doing now is is mainly really because I might have several UIs, right? So if this thing gets infinitesimally close to S at several points, uh, when I get uh, these uh, several Lagrange multipliers and. The thing is, uh, I would like, uh, you know, our, our idea from the beginning, uh, if I have several ones, what do I do, right? So, <laughs> and the idea is somehow, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of uh, interpolate, but so is uh, Lagrange multipliers are non-negative. And I will take, uh, yeah, I mean, here it, it was essential that lambda is non-negative, right? But if I interpolate somehow so that at one point I get this Lagrange multiplier and at the other one I get that one, then uh, what should what would I have to I would have to I would like a sum of squares, right? Because when afterwards yeah, I can move it to the other side and I stay in the quadratic module. <laughs> okay, so I would like a sum of squares. So I somehow I would like to interpolate so that I get an uh, interpolation polynomial somehow for these Lagrange multipliers. Uh, but uh, they should be sums of squares. And so uh, I take here, uh, uh, this should be under the under square root here. So you know, the square root sign is not long enough here. Uh, so I take the roots of these multipliers and I interpolate, but I need it, uh, I need, uh, I need uh, to be very careful because uh, afterwards I will, you know, uh, I will need that this is uh, actually congruent even modulo i x u to a three uh, to that s i is congruent even modulo i x u to the three to the square root of lambda u i. We'll see later why. And square root of lambda u i is of course finite, right? And uh, and I can do this for all i uh, and for all u in f. So all these Lagrange multipliers at uh, yeah. And uh, well. Should I call lambda u zero a Lagrange multiplier? I don't know, but uh, yeah, let me call it Lagrange multiplier. And uh, and uh, and yeah, and why can I do this? Why can I do this? Because we i x u to the three are pairwise co prime in the ring o curly o x, right? You know, I want that S i is in curly O also, right? So I really have to do, I so have to solve this, this system of simultaneous congruences in O R, right? And for this, I need, yeah, I want to employ, of course, the Chinese remainder theorem. So I, I, I need that these 
I x u to the three are pairwise co prime. Now this is because we I x u are pairwise co prime, right? When we I x u to the three are also pairwise co prime. In nine one seven, I have seen that way of pairwise co prime. And uh, right, and that that works if the standard parts of these two tuples are are not the same, right? And uh, yes, and why are they not the same? Because the standard part of x u is u, and the u's were pairwise different, of course, right? Um, okay, right, exactly, and. Now this lambda u zero is a little bit special, uh, because uh, that was infinitesimal, right? I mean the other ones were just finite and non-negative, but that one was infinitesimal and non-negative. That's a special one, and we want that uh, coefficients of s zero are also infinitesimal for later purpose, right? It seems plausible that we want this because this was infinitesimal now. We want also to interpolate with something infinitesimal. Uh, can we do this now? Well, the squared of uh, uh, lambda u zero was infinitesimal for each u, right? Now take uh, when u ranges over f, uh, take a uh, look at these square roots, they are all infinitesimal, and take uh, the biggest one among them, uh, right? And uh, and uh, and divide uh, uh, by the biggest one, right? So let's say the biggest one is uh, is uh, I don't know which letter to use is uh, uh, lambda <laughs> or lambda zero. Okay. Okay. So um, well. Let's say mu because yeah, let's say mu doesn't matter. Um, biggest one let's say is mu. Okay, and um, and then look at these instead of these roots, right? And uh, when these are all less than or equal one, in particular, they are all finite. And uh, and mu is also infinitesimal, and when uh, now uh, do the same thing. So let's say S zero should first be congruent to these things for each u, and then um, and then I I multiply with mu, right? Uh, yes. Uh, and so uh, multiplying with mu, the coefficients of S zero makes that all coefficients are infinitesimal afterwards. Huh? It's an easy scaling argument. So when we have that uh, si squared uh, is congruent uh, to lambda ui uh, modulo i x u to the three, of course, right? Um, yes, okay. Which means, in other words, that uh, s i squared vanishes at x or s i squared at x u is lambda u i. So I have this interpolating property I was speaking about. But I have also that the gradient of s i squared at x u uh, is uh, zero, right? Because, uh, yeah, because. Uh, uh, Yes, because um, si squared minus lambda ui lies in i x u to the 3 and therefore in i x u to the 2 and therefore its gradient vanishes but the gradient of lambda ui is of course 0, right? And the, um, the Hessian uh, also is 0, right? So yeah, that's now easy to see that i x u to the 3 is actually the polynomials, uh, well, oh, um, you could also say that si squared minus lambda ui lies in i x u to the 3, so equals some polynomial in i x u to the 3, but the polynomials in i x u to the 3 obviously have zero Hessian, right? And so, uh, so, uh, 
So the Hessian of SI squared equals the Hessian of lambda ui, which is zero at xu, sorry. Yes, so, okay. So I have this very nice interpolating polynomials. Okay, and now we continue on the next page. It's a long proof. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now it's it suffices to show that L uh, minus um, that L minus S zero squared, right? In, instead of L, okay. Instead of, uh, you know, locally we were looking at this, right? So at, for all U and F, but uh, now globally, L minus, I look at L minus S uh, zero squared, right? Minus the sum from I equal one to M, uh, S I squared, uh, right? So we S I squared replaces this, um, one minus gi to the 2k, that's also new, that's a, a thing I introduce here, times gi. Uh -huh. Okay, so, uh, and uh, I take this polynomial, that's simply my idea, right? I think it should now be more or less clear where this idea comes from. And, um, you know, uh, a little bit was, it was explained already here, Right, it's still the main idea, but the thing is that, um, yeah, that I have now is, um, yeah, so in some sense, L minus S0 squared will be this infin infinitesimal deformation, which I have talked about, which touches now exactly at xu2 and xu1, right? And, and that's this other trick here, which, which I have to, which I have to do to satisfy the condition on the Hessian in theorem 9114, right? Okay, so let's see. So in any case, it suffices to show that there is a K in N such that this polynomial lies in M, right? Because when I move just the S0 squared and with sum of the S I squared 1 minus GI to the 2K GI, I mean, that's also a sum of squares, right? Well, that's also a square here, uh, with S I squared times one minus G I to the two K is a square. So when I move this to the other side and I see where L lies in M, right? So that's trivial. So, and the thing here is that uh, by, um, by this triple star and double star, this lies in I X U squared intersection U in F as it is required here by this um, lemma 1038, which you want to apply, right? So in order to, no, sorry. Sorry, that was the Lagrange multiplier thing. I meant, I meant uh, theorem 9114, right? So that we can satisfy this here. So why is this? Uh, so let's see, so double star was, was that, um, Lambda U I G I. So if if you calculate modulo X I X U uh, squared, I have to show that modulo I X U squared this is zero, right? Okay, and modulo I X U squared, we um, this uh, G I times one minus G I to the two K uh, is. Uh, since this was true for all k in n, it's also true for 2k. So this is, um, if I, aha, uh -huh. okay, so, uh, okay, so modulo i x u squared, um, aha, uh -huh. okay, Mo modulo i x, let, let's first look at triple star. I mean, triple star first, right? So, okay, triple star first. So, um, modulo i x u cube, uh, cubed, uh, and therefore also my modulo i x u squared. 
uh, I have it uh, SI squared uh, is congruent to lambda UI, right? So for fixed U, I can actually, it's, it's sufficient to, to show this for lambda UI, with lambda UI here, right? And, uh, and uh, but now if I have this, I can look at double star, namely modulo I X U squared, uh, lambda U I G I equals lambda U I G I one minus G I to a two K, right? So in, in fact, uh, I can then delete this and uh, and S U and yeah, by triple star S U S zero squared, I forgot that. I have that this is lambda u is congruent to lambda u zero modulo i modulo i x u cubed and therefore i x u squared. Okay, so I have here lambda u i. Yeah, and uh, so for, for every i, I have just to show that this lies in i x u squared. And uh, yeah, and um, Sorry, that should be lambda u zero here, and then so I have l minus lambda u zero minus uh, this thing, and this lies in i x u squared. So by this, uh, I see that this lies in i x u squared for fixed u, and if I do that for every u, same arguments for every u, then I get here that it's in in the intersection of all uh, i x u squared. Okay. So by theorem nine one fourteen, I have to uh, find. Um, uh, let, let let me call. Uh, aha. So I have uh, satisfied uh, this condition here. Uh, um, I have satisfied. Uh, Let's see. Ah, okay. I've satisfied this condition. If if f is this, if let's say f k, everything depends still on k, right? So I will adjust k later. So let me call this f k, and uh, if I want to apply nine one fourteen to f k, when I have satisfied uh, the first condition, which is the one which is not on the standard part. And when I have the two other ones are on the standard part, right? And so uh, I still have to show these two conditions. And when I'm done, right? Okay. Uh, I said uh, that I would call this here FK. Uh, actually, I call FK the standard part of it, right? And the standard part of it is actually, well, GIs are already real, so I don't have to take standard parts of these polynomials. So I call FKs with uh, this thing here. And it's in, yeah, it's better to call the standard part of this FK because now I have to work only with a standard part in order to see that the condition, uh, that this positivity condition and this uh, condition on the Hessian is positive. Uh, is fulfilled. Okay, so and 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 so I have to show that with standard part with F K for some K, right? Uh, I will. I don't know what K will be, but uh, for some K is positive on S without F, right? And the Hessian of F K at U is positive definite for all U in F. I mean, that's just a rewriting of, of these conditions, right? Right? Okay, because, uh, yeah. Because for, for the XIs, I, I take care, of course, the, the XUKs, or the X, uh, sorry, the XUs, where U ranges over F, right? So the standard part of the XUs these are exactly the U's from, from F, right? So I have here S without F, right? And um, yeah. So note for later use that FK and the gradient of FK vanish on F uh, for all K in N, right? Because if I, 
this if I um, Yeah, that should be uh, pretty clear. So, um, yes, uh, I mean, we if I plug in, uh, yes, I mean, the, the gr yeah, okay, so the, yeah, of course, because this polynomial vanishes at xu. And uh, its gradient vanishes at x u, right? Because it's an i x u squared for, e for each u in f. And now, that, of course, when the standard part of this polynomial vanishes at the standard part of uh, of uh, of uh, x u, which was u for each u in f, and uh, and the gradient uh, also. So, in order to find such a k. Uh, in order to find such a k that these two conditions are fulfilled, I mean this one and this one, okay. Um, we calculate the, the Hessian, right, in order to see what happens with this condition. So the Hessian of fq fq fk at u, if u is an f, uh, by triple star, um, uh, so by triple star, uh, you know, by triple star, the Hessian of uh, of Esh, uh, okay, we we. We Hessian, okay, so SI squared and lambda UI. Uh, so we, the elements from I X U to the three obviously have zero Hessian at U, zero gradient at U, and uh, and they vanish at, at X U, right? So, um, so, uh, and uh, yeah, so S I so so I can um, so I can replace here the S I squared if I'm if I'm calculating the Hessian. Uh, I'm, yeah, I have to apply the, if I apply the Hessian, if I calculate the Hessian of fk, I have to calculate the Hessian of these things, right? When, when the Hessian of these terms here. And, you know, the si squared, um, uh, so we, so also these things are of course congruent modulo i x u to the three to lambda u to a standard part of lambda u i one minus g i to the two k g i. So uh, so I can for this purpose here I can of calculating this session at u I can exchange the s i squared by lambda u i right and uh, that's what I do here. And uh, and then it gets also easy because this uh, yeah this is just a constant and I take just the Hessian of this thing at you, right? And we this disappears because it's linear when I take the Hessian. Okay, and uh, when this is uh, aha, but this Hessian we have calculated now ten to nine, so everything comes uh, will come out fine now. 10 to 9. So the Hessian of such a thing here, right, is the Hessian of this minus, so if if if, if I'm in a point where g vanishes, right, it's the Hessian of g minus 2k gradient of g gradient of g transposed. Yeah. So uh, 
Now, if I'm doing this with 2k, I will get here 4k, right? So let's see, so we get here, uh, and I have here a minus, so I uh, switch the two things here. And now, um, yes, and um, uh, 10 to 9 worked. Um, if G, 10 to 9 worked, in the case, where are we? 10 to 9 worked in the case where, uh, you know, G of X here is zero, right? So it's, um, so I uh, uh, employed it here. Uh, I was taking the Hessian at, uh, at U. So what I would need is that GI of, uh, what I would need is that GI of U uh, is zero, right? Um, and, but star says that if GI of, um, um, aha, uh -huh, so, okay, if, if GI of U is non-zero, right, then, uh, when uh, the standard part of GI of X U is non-zero, right? Right. Be, be, I mean, the standard part of uh, okay. Okay. Let's see. So, if GI of U is non-zero, uh, right? When uh, when the, when Aha, so maybe I should have remarked this. So if GI of U if GI of U is non-zero, when GI of X U is non-zero, and when lambda U I is zero, right? Uh, because um, you know uh, if GI of X U is zero, when GI of U must be zero because uh, that's the standard part of GI of X U, right? Because GI is real and standard part of X U is U. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so that means uh, whenever GI of U is, uh, is non-zero when the lambda U I is or, or zero. Okay. And, and that's why this works here, right? Uh, even though not every GI of U has to be zero, it works nevertheless because if GI of U is non-zero, when the standard part of lambda UI, actually lambda UI is when zero. Okay, maybe I should have been a bit more, uh, I should have gone uh, more into details here in the lecture notes, I don't know. That's for each U and K in N. And by lemma 10 to uh, 10, uh, 10 to 10, where are we? Uh, 10 to, yeah, by this, uh, by this lemma here. Oh, that was not good. Okay, by this lemma here one I have put into a green box. So suppose G is a polynomial, U is, uh, G of U is zero. When the following are equivalent, G is strictly quasi-concave that U is equivalent to where exists a K in N such that G times one minus G to a K is strictly concave at U, right? Which means that the Hessian is negative definite at U. And, uh, or that uh, there exists a K in N such that for all, for all L greater than or equal K we have that this is strictly concave at U. Okay. And so, um, we can choose a K in N such that all GI of 1 minus GI of 2K are strictly concave on on this uh, finite subset of uh, of f, I mean f is already a finite set, so and this subset therefore is also finite. So we have this 
set of all x in f such that gi of x is zero, right? Um, for each i and um, yes, I mean in each of these finitely many points, uh, this is strictly concave for sufficiently big k, and since there are only finitely many such points, I can find the k such that it works for all of them, right? Because I have this, uh, because I have here this uh, third condition here, right? Okay. Um, since we now ten three eight c, my Lagrange multiplier theorem here uh, said, uh, and now this comes, uh, yeah, now this. Uh, uh, so the standard part of this lambda u, for some of these lambda u i or lambda u j, I don't know, is non infinitesimal. For some, uh, yes. Um, uh, yes, so actually what I meant here is uh, probably lambda u i, right? So let me call this lambda u1. Lambda U of M uh, for for uh, for U in F. Uh, this was uh, positive. The sum of these Lagrange multipliers was positive. Even the standard part was positive since it was not infinitesimal. We get together with uh, with star. Um, we get together with. Uh, with star in 10 to 9. Okay, 10 to 9 was again this thing here, right? That recession. I mean, if if this is strictly concave and it means that recession is negative definite, it means that this here is negative uh, definite at this point. So we get that um yeah we get that uh um we get that the hessian of f k at u is positive definite for all u in f right but that's because one of these standard parts is non infinitesimal right i mean uh uh these Hessians here, uh, for both, um, ah, yeah, I use here again star because, okay, so whenever GI of, uh, of U is, uh, is non-zero when the lambda UI is zero, right? Okay. And um, when chi of u um, is zero, uh, then uh, this is uh, this is uh, negative definite. So 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 all of I mean there is at least one. Uh -huh. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so 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 we can we can sum here up only our woes such that a chi of u uh, is uh, not zero, since otherwise the corresponding Lagrange multiplier uh, here is is zero, right? Okay. So I sum here on the over bows where chi of u is zero. And um and for bows uh I have that uh this is uh this session here is now uh negative definite negative definite. 
and uh and um and now i need only that uh that there is at least uh ah okay and and when where i need that one of these standard parts is positive right one of these standard parts is positive so one of these uh aha uh -huh. but i would maybe need that what it's one of the standard parts of of a lambda ui where chi of u is is zero actually um yes um but if chi of u um but if chi of u is non zero as I said when lambda ui is zero so I can forget the corresponding lambda ui in this sum. Yeah, and then one of the remaining ones once of once of those lambda uis which are still in the sum, even if I restrict the sum over those i such that chi of u is zero, one of these has to be positive non-infinitesimal, right? Okay, so and therefore um and therefore I get that the session of fk at u is uh is positive definite for all u in f. I don't think I need this second equation here, I need only this equation. Let's see what we will need this for later. So for all u in f I have this. And that's uh, you know what uh, my theorem which I want to apply. Uh, yeah, so this is what, what I need here also, right? Yes, but I have to take care of this still, right? That's the only thing I still have to take care of. Um, in particular, we can choose k0 such a version of fk0 of u is positive definite for all u in f. Uh, here it was written that uh, for all sufficiently large k that works. Now let me take for the moment the k0. And since fk0 and now it gets technical, since fk0 and the gradient of fk0 vanish on f, okay, uh, yeah, that was true, yeah, right, for each fk. Uh, we have by elementary analysis that there is an open subset u of r to the n containing uh, f such that f of k0 is greater than or equal on u. It's actually, yeah, it's actually um, greater than 0 on u without f, right? That's because, you know, if you have a function, if you have a sufficiently smooth function, which is zero somewhere, its gradient is zero, and the Hessian is positive definite, when locally around the point, it's uh, positive, right? Except at a point, of course. Yeah. And, and, and here I've, I'm doing this with finitely many points and, and yeah, when I find, of course, I can take just the union of these finitely many neighborhoods. Okay, so I have to correct in the script this here and also this here. When S without U uh, is compact, right, S is compact and U was open, so I intersect S with a closed set, so it's still compact, so that you can choose N in N such that the standard part of L is greater than or equal 1 over N uh, on S uh, without U, right? Because it's... Um, um, yes, FK0, I mean, that was a real polynomial, is positive on U without F, right? So, on... Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so why is the standard part of L uh, positive on S without U? Because was uh, because F is a set uh, of all elements where the standard part of L uh, 
uh, vanishes, right? The set of all elements u and s where standard part vanishes. So that's that's why uh, I mean u u contains f and or even on s without f, l is standard part of l is positive, but now on s without u is a compact set where the standard part of l is a positive, strictly positive, and therefore I find this low bound one hour capital N. And and yeah, and the standard part of S I squared is less than or equal N on S without U. Right? I could take two different bounds, but when just yeah, I can always since these are just two bounds, I don't want to introduce too much notation. So I expressed everything with, with, with this capital N. Now f k, which was this here, is greater than or equal, you know, one over n on s without u uh, minus um, minus um, you know standard part of s i squared was at least was at most n. So in the worst case, I have to replace this by n, you know, because this is something. Yeah. Exactly, so because this will be non-negative on uh, on S, right? GIs are non-negative on S. Um, so this uh, becomes N in a pessimistic view. When I have here M for the number of summons and uh, I have 1 over K by exercise 10 for 1 because we GI on S are between 0 and 1, right? And here I have you know, yeah. Now, now it's really exercise ten for one with silly little exercise in the beginning. Uh, this calculus exercise. Where was it? It was here, right? Okay. Now, for all sufficiently large k in n. With k greater than or equal k zero, we now have that f k is bigger zero on s without u. Yes, because you know if k is sufficiently large, right? Because of this, and because of f k is greater than or equal f k of f k zero because k was greater than or equal k zero, right? Use again that uh, you know zero. You know, one minus g i on s is between zero and one, right? So if I enlarge this coefficient, uh, this exponent, then can only get smaller somehow, right? So uh, that means I subtract, uh, I subtract less, right? So that means that f k greater than or equal f k zero on on s. Uh, well, that's on that's true on on, on s, right? Um, if k greater than or equal f k zero, I guess that's true on s. But when uh, it's positive, uh, f k zero is positive on s intersected u. Well, f k zero is. Uh, positive on uh -huh, on u on u without f right that would be true on u without f but this is true on s so if I intersect s with u I actually have to subtract f I forgot that I guess that's really a serious issue here when I have both when I have this greater than or equal and when I have this greater than and so uh, and so if k is bigger than zero on s uh, not completely true maybe right I wanted this. Uh... Okay, I want it here without f. Okay. Okay. 
and where, therefore if k is positive on s without s, right? It's still missing here, I guess. <laughs> but that was what 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 I still needed to show. That uh, that was I mean I have already this condition now and I needed still this, and that's what I have here. Okay, good. Okay, great. Um. So what do we prove now? Um. Yeah, it was this uh, theorem ten four two. That's what we have proven. And now we take a, uh, we draw a corollary out of it. Um, namely, we have, if you have the same situation, right? Uh, exactly the same situation. And um, yeah, and uh, if, uh, if, uh, if L is from a real closed field, right, such that L is non negative on the transfer when L lies in the quadratic module generated uh, in R, uh, in, in the quadratic module o over R, right? So the thing is that, uh, yes, so, um, yes, that's, that's of course, uh, that's of course now. Um, yeah, that seems to be less stronger, right? Okay. Um, and that's all I'm going to need. I will not make use of the fact that these are in OR, that, that I need only the quadratic module generated also in this OR joint X. I will not make use of this. Um, yes, and so, so now I can translate this, uh, using the, you know, technique we had, which we have seen so many times now, uh, I can translate this, um, into a statement about the real numbers. Okay, so let M be same situation again, right? And uh, but now I'm I'm instead of looking at real closed extension fields, I just say there exists a bound D, a positive integer such that for all polynomials over reals of degree of of all linear polynomials over reals, which are non-negative on S of G, instead of on the transfer of uh, of it, we have that uh, L lies in MD of G. So I have this here, this truncated quadratic module, which is great, right? Okay. Okay. And that's similar to proofs, to other proofs like 545923. 545 was, uh, was the existence of degree bounds for Hilbert 17th problem, where we had first, uh, yeah, uh, we could do this because we had uh, a statement uh, of Hilbert 17th. Uh, I mean, we got the degree bounds somehow for free since we had Hilbert solution of uh, Hilbert, uh, sorry, Artin solution of Hilbert 17th problem uh, was valid over all real closed fields. And, um, and, uh, and 9 to 3, 9 to 3. We we also got uh, yeah that that we don't see now, but that was degree bounds for Putinas theorem, right? And these degree bounds for Putinas theorem they depended on 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 other on 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 more on more geometric data, right? They were not as nice as the degree bounds for Hilbert seventeenth problem. And yes, and um, 
Yes, but here uh, it seems now uh, okay, right? So, uh, of course, for degree bound here, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I mean, what was already in, already with the degree bounds for putting us theorem depended on the whole situation here, but at least once we have uh, proven, depended really on, on the description of a, semi of a basic closed semi algebraic set, depended on the polynomials GI, right? And that's here the same. So with GIs and everything is fixed, VM, you know, is fixed. Um, and, and when there exists the D, it depends, of course, on M, G, the number of variables N, right? But, uh, but it exists and, and and it does not depend on L because there exists with D such that for all L which are non negative on S of G, we have L is in MD of G. So, uh, important thing for us, it does not depend on L. So, yeah, how do you prove this? For each D in N, consider the class SD of all pairs R, A0, A1, etc., AN, where R is a real closed extension field of reals. And we A, I, R uh, in this real closed field such that whenever for all X in the transfer of S, so uh, that means for all X satisfying the polynomial inequalities GI of X greater than or equal zero, we have this, right? Um, yeah, because you know these AIs are coefficients of L somehow, right? And uh, uh, so Consider a class of all uh, class SD of all these pairs, such that whenever this is true, whenever this holds a polynomial, this polynomial is the sum of d elements from R joint X, where each term in the sum is of degree at most d and is of a form p squared g i with p in R x and i in, in zero to m, where g zero is a constant one polynomial. So this this can this uh, is in fact a semi algebraic class by real quantifier elimination, right? So you know I have this uh, uh, have this uh, for example to express that this is the sum of d elements uh, where each term is of at most of degree and d and is of this form, you know that's. Uh, that can be expressed so the existence of these uh, p of these polynomials p such where p squared gi is of degree at most d this, this can be written by the existence of finitely many coefficients of p of a finitely many coefficients of p and uh, you know when I have some kind of uh, polynomial uh, identity which I can express by just comparing coefficients on both sides and yes and all this gives me a semi-algebraic expression so it's, it's a semi-algebraic class of course I use here real quantify elimination in order to see this but it is an n plus one area r semi-algebraic class actually okay r semi-algebraic because you know we GIs were polynomials over the reals and for example here I have to write that for all x such that gi of x is greater than or equal zero for each i this is true and yeah so i have to there are polynomials with real coefficients appearing there not just with integer coefficients or something like this okay and then the usual thing i call yeah and d is at the same time a bound uh, on the number of elements and on the degree so in fact, I could also, here I want to bound the degree, I could also bound the number of elements, but that's not interesting. That was 928a, this remark, if you remember, we had that already. And when I take uh, this uh, curly E uh, set of events, if you want, this is the set of, is the, the class of events, or is the class of all these classes, SD. And uh, it's somehow directed upwards. So for all d1, d2, where exists d3 such that sd1 union sd2 is contained in sd3. And uh, we have a union of these is curly, o, curly r to the n plus 1 by 10, 4, 3, right? And, um, right? Uh, and now uh, 5, 4, 2 yields that... Uh, 
certification of SD is Rn plus one for some D in N. Yeah, it was this. It was a uh, finiteness theorem for semi-algebraic classes or some consequence of it, right? And uh, yes, and then this shows Yeah, this shows everything, okay, if you think about it. Okay, so now our lectures culminate in the following result, which is a contribution to a theory of solving systems of polynomial inequalities. So this is, um, uh, so let M, so exactly the same situation as before. And as, as I said, these, these hypotheses are actually quite mild. They are restricting, but not too much usually. And uh, so of course, what what you really, I mean, S of G compact and non-empty interior is of course a real restriction, of course. But with um, non-empty interior near a convex boundary, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, GI, at least with GI strictly quasi-concave on this convex boundary where GI is active, that's not too restricting, I argued, right? It's restricting, but not, not extremely, not really very restricting. Okay, when SD of G is a convex L of S of G. That's the best thing you can hope. The degree D Lasser relaxation associated to G is the convex hull of a basic closed semi-algebraic S of G. Basic closed semi-algebraic set S of G for all sufficiently large D. And of course, in practice, you would like to know for which D. So the hope is that it happens for small D because when you can treat, yeah, when you have, when, sem, when you can really, semi-definite programming can treat in a very nice way with S of G, right? For example, you can compute points in it, at least numerically, okay? Yeah, so in the proof, well, uh, it gets technical, but only for some silly reasons. Uh, you could probably also avoid with case distinctions in some other way, but I wanted to use, um, the thing is that I wanted to use 10, 4, 4, uh, no, sorry, uh, 10, uh, 1, 16, where we uh, had uh, characterized when this happens, right? When the Lasser relaxation is exact, and this is exactly in this case, right? If for every linear polynomial that is non-negative on S of G, it lies in this detruncated module associated to G. And um, yeah, I want to apply this, so I would have I have to show this here. Um, um, yes, we have to show that there exists a D in N such that this is true uh, if 10 in 10 1 16 although in 10 1 16 i have to be a bit careful and that uh, that's perhaps a problem here i need that s of g has non-empty interior uh, and that's uh, <laughs> it seems like this is implied by uh, non empty uh, having non empty interior near its convex near the convex boundary, but you have to be careful because S could be empty, right? I mean, you could treat this, you could do this in another way, probably avoiding the case distinction. But I wanted to employ 10 1 16, and in 10 1 16, I need probably for the other direction, which I don't really apply, that we. Um, that the uh, semi-algebraic set has non-empty interior. Now, either I argue that I don't really need this because I'm applying the other direction where I didn't really need it, or I just uh, treat the case where the, not, where the interior is empty separately. And I decided to treat the case where the interior is empty separately. But uh, if the interior of S is non-empty, uh, when I can just, um, when the conditions of theorem 10, 1, 16 are met and we have to show this, 
which is exactly what the previous corollary said, which is exactly what uh, this corollary said. And when, yeah, now I have somehow left with the special cases, which are actually easier, much easier, where um, the interior of S uh, is empty, um, so, um, so in this case, uh, so if S is non-empty, if S of G is non-empty, then the interior is actually non-empty. So the only case that remains will be that S of G is empty. Because why is this? So if S of G is non-empty, why is when the interior non-empty? Well, M of G is Archimedean, therefore S of G is compact. And um, the convex boundary of S of G uh, is then uh, also non-empty because you just have to take a linear, um, a linear form on R to the N and it will have a minimum, it will take on a minimum on this compact non-empty set S of G by 7119. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows this. And then by 1035, this will be an element of a convex boundary. 1035, let's see if we have it here. Um, yeah, it, I don't have it here, but, uh, but that was, you remember it, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, and if convex boundary is non-empty, since it has non-empty interior near the convex boundary, if there is a point on the convex boundary, then uh, there must be a neighborhood of it which intersects the interior of S, and therefore uh, the interior of S cannot be empty, of course, by definition of, by what it means of having uh, non-empty interior near the convex boundary. So it was definition 10.3.4. which I also don't find right now. Anyway, um, so the only space that uh, special case that remains is that S of G is empty. But when, for example, by, you know, Putinas theorem uh, or uh, by 1044 also, let's take 1044. Um, For example, right, um, or by other theorems, uh, we have it since minus one is greater than or equal only empty set. That we have minus one is in M D of G for some D. Right, I could use plenty of other theorems we had to see that minus one is in M of G. So. But if minus one is in M of G, then LD of G, uh, a Sayer spectrohedron, which we defined in 1015, um, which I also don't find now, <laughs> uh, is empty because, um, you know, such a, uh, this consisted of linear forms that map one to one, and now I should map minus one uh, to something non-negative um, because we should map everything in. I mean, minus one is in MD of G for sufficiently big D and then the corresponding LD of G uh, is empty. And also if you increase D of course, because a linear form that maps one to one cannot map minus one to something non-negative, but maps minus one to minus one, right? <laughs> okay. And therefore, yeah, the D of G is empty and thus, uh, well, that's here. Yeah. So that was the D Lasser, the degree D Lasser spectrohedron, and that's the degree, uh, or I, I think I said that's the degree D state space associated to G, and that's the 
its projection, which, which is uh, a D-plus air relaxation of Gs when projection of the empty set is empty. And as D of G is when empty for all sufficiently large D and S of G also. Okay, that was a bit annoying uh, that I did this case separately here. Um, one could have avoided doing it separately, I guess. Okay, but that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the end. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Okay. And yeah, many thanks for joining all these lectures. Um, at the moment, there will not be any continuation. Let's see if there is one in several years. <laughs> um, okay, many thanks and have a good time. Goodbye.